What comes to mind when you hear the term movement? Maybe it's reaching out with your arm to grab a pen, or getting up and walking across a room, or maybe it's something much more complex. Even the simplest of movements, however, have a certain degree of complexity to them and require a fundamental understanding of basic anatomical and biomechanical principles. As we will be referencing a number of these movements as we move through the Anatomy 407 course, it's not a bad idea to review these basic principles out of the gate. This is the focus of this second review session. Good day, and welcome once again to the second review podcast. I'm Dr. Stuart Ingalls. In the previous session, we reviewed some basic anatomical concepts that are universal to the field of anatomy. This time around, we focus on principles more specific to the concepts of movements, starting with the definition of the term itself. At the start of this session, we highlighted some of the different forms that movement can take. With so much variability, it can become difficult to develop a clear definition for movement. Consult a dictionary and you'll read that movement is an act of changing physical location or position or of having this changed. Not overly helpful for our purposes. We need something a little more specific. For our discussion moving forward, movement can be considered any type of change in the relative position or orientation of two or more bones across a joint. Reflecting on previous courses, you will probably recall the different classification systems used for joints, including structural classification. We'll be discussing a couple of types of fibrocartilaginous joints early on in the course, but for the most part, our discussion will be focused upon synovial joints, which consists of two or more high aligned lined bone surfaces separated by a true joint space, bound by a capsule and membrane, and filled with synovial fluid. Before we jump into the different joint types and the movements they permit, we need to back up for a minute and review the different reference axes. These can be considered imaginary lines that pass directly through a particular joint and about which the movement rotates. For conceptualization of these axes, it helps to relate back to our three fundamental planes, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Conceptually, each axis can be considered to exist along the intersection of two of these three planes. For example, if we highlight the sagittal and frontal planes, we have the vertical line of intersection called the longitudinal axis. Similarly, the sagittal and transverse planes intersect to form the sagittal axis, which runs from anterior to posterior while the frontal and transverse planes intersect to form the transverse axis, which extends bilaterally. The reason we relate the axes back to the anatomical planes is that it helps us to define the nature of joint movements. Generally speaking, movements typically occur when a limb segment moves along one of these three planes. Once we define the plane that the limb segment is moving in, the intersection point of the other two planes defines the axis of rotation for the joint permitting the motion. Let's take the example of cycling. Here, the movements of the thigh and leg are within a sagittal plane. As we just described, the other two planes, frontal and transverse, define the transverse axis projecting from side to side. This represents the axis of rotation for both the hip and knee joints, permitting the sagittal movements of the thigh and leg. The movements permitted at a given joint are dictated by the architecture of that joint, specifically the geometry of the articulating surfaces. Synovial joints can be subclassified into six different types based on their architecture, which provides us with information on how these joints move. Each joint type can be characterized as being uniaxial, permitting movement along a single plane, biaxial, permitting movement within two planes, and multiaxial, permitting movement in multiple directions. The first three joints we will look at demonstrate how slight changes in architecture can change a joint from uniaxial to biaxial to multiaxial. Hinge joints are so named because of their resemblance to a door hinge apparatus. Geometrically, they can be thought of as cylinders articulating with a complementary elongated concave trough. Numerous examples can be found throughout the body, including the elbow, knee, and interphalangeal joints. These are uniaxial joints. The curved cylinder can roll within the concave trough, but the straight long axis means that they can't wobble back and forth or rotate in space. 
Condyloid joints are similar to hinge joints in that a convex surface rests in a complementary elongated concave trough. The difference is that condyloid joints are curved along the elongated axis as well. Think of an egg resting within a complementary cup. This permits wobble from side to side as well as rolling from front to back, making condyloid joints biaxial. Note that because there is an elongated axis, we do not see rotation between the two surfaces. Ball and socket joints are similar to condyloid joints, except that there is no longer an elongated axis. Instead, the convex surface is perfectly spherical, hence the name. Because of this, we once again see rolling back and forth, wobble side to side, but now the spherical orientation means that the spherical surface can rotate within the concave surface as well, making these joints multi-axial. The shoulders and hips are examples of ball and socket joints. The remaining three joints are a little more unique in their architecture. Planar joints have the most simple design of all the synovial joints, composed of two flat surfaces that permit a certain degree of glide, restricted only by the joint capsule and surrounding ligaments. Since the surfaces permit movement in a variety of directions, planar joints, although simple, are considered multiaxial. Pivot joints are formed by a cylindrical bone mass enveloped by bone and ligament. The cylindrical surface allows rotation between the two bony surfaces. As this is the only motion allowed within pivot joints, they are considered uniaxial. The last type of joint is also the most conceptually complex. The saddle joint involves two complementary surfaces, each being concave along one axis and convex along the perpendicular axis. By turning the surfaces to a position of 180 degrees relative to one another, the concave and convex surfaces align, allowing articulation. The name comes from the saddle-like appearance of the articulating surfaces. You can easily demonstrate the saddle joint on yourself using the webbing between your index finger and thumb. Notice the concave surface when the hand is viewed from the palmar aspect. Now, if you rotate your hand 90 degrees, you'll notice that this webbing creates a convex surface separating the palmar and dorsal surfaces on the hand. If we take our two hands and rotate one 90 degrees to the other, the webbing on one hand interlocks with that on the other hand. This allows a certain amount of surface glide up and down and front and back, but because of how my fingers are interlocked, I can't freely rotate the surfaces along one another. Consequently, this is considered a biaxial joint. Movement front to back and up and down, but no rotation. Okay, up to this point in time, we've been describing movements using pretty loosely defined terms. It's been helpful for describing the movements at different joints, but you know, let's face it, front to back, up and down, side to side, don't really mean very much anatomically. We need to define the specific movements seen at each joint. To help with conceptualization, we can pair a number of these movements together as antagonists to one another. Flexion and extension generally occur within the sagittal plane along the transverse axis. Flexion is defined as a decrease in the joint angle between proximal and distal segments from anatomical position, while extension is an increase in this joint angle in a return to anatomical position. This is the standard motion associated with uniaxial hinge joints, but also takes place in condyloid and ball and socket joints. Note that with many of these joints, such as the shoulder and hip, we can easily extend the joint beyond anatomical position. Anatomically, we can refer to this as hyperextension, although most people will still prefer to refer to this simply as extension. This is because hyperextension has a very different meaning in both a clinical setting and in colloquial terms as well. Most people hear hyperextension, they immediately think injury. Still, it's good to be aware of the proper terminology, even if you're discouraged from using it. There are a number of other situations where we'll hear the term flexion and extension used. The first is lateral flexion and extension, which refers to bending at the trunk to the side and return to anatomical position. Another is lateral flexion and extension of the shoulders, in which the arms move forward and then back out in the transverse plane. Finally, we can introduce a pair of terms that are used at the ankle, and which can create some confusion. The first is plantar flexion which is a movement through the transverse axis of the ankle that draws the long axis of the foot down within the sagittal plane. The converse movement at the ankle is dorsiflexion, in which the long axis of the foot is drawn up within the sagittal plane. Here's where the confusion comes in. 
Anatomically, we consider the plantar surface of the foot to be analogous to the palmar surface of the hand. It makes sense if you think of somebody that's walking on all fours. Now, there shouldn't be any problem with identifying these movements at the wrist as being flexion and extension, right? But with the foot, it creates some confusion because in resting anatomical position, the ankle is considered to be at about 270 degrees of extension. The act of plantar flexion decreases this ankle, so it's considered to be a form of flexion. Now, despite its name, the act of dorsiflexion increases this angle, which means that anatomically speaking, dorsiflexion is actually a form of extension. And no one's going to blame you if you need to rewind and listen to that explanation again. And maybe again. The next pair of movements we can discuss are abduction and adduction. These movements occur primarily in the frontal plane along a sagittal axis. With abduction, a limb segment is drawn away from the midline of the body. Adduction is the opposing motion of drawing the limb segments back towards the midline. The concept of taking away and adding to the midline should help you to remember the meanings of these terms. Normally we think of abduction and adduction as occurring at the shoulders and hips, but we can also think of the term in relation to the digits of the hands and feet. Imagine a midline passing through the third or middle digit of the hand. Splaying of the digits away from the midline would be considered abduction, while drawing the digits back towards the midline would be considered adduction. If I were to bother to take off my shoes and socks, I could show you the same thing with my toes, but I think you get the idea. While we're on the topic, I should make mention of a couple of special cases of frontal plane motion seen at the wrist and ankle. Note that the wrist is a condyloid joint, meaning that it permits flexion and extension, but also abduction and adduction in the frontal plane. In the case of the wrist, however, we generally refer to the movement of hand abduction as radial deviation and that of adduction as ulnar deviation, as this minimizes confusion for situations when the hand is not in anatomical position. Take a look at this image on the left, for example. This is quite literally a bare bones representation of the wrist, and we have no frame of reference for where the torso is. You should recall from previous courses, however, that the distal radius, highlighted here in green, is larger than the distal ulna, which is highlighted in blue. Without any ever reference label, we can correctly label these movements as ulnar and radial deviation, respectively. Another place where we see frontal plane movement is at the feet. The ankle is a hinge joint, but through a combination of joint play and intertarsal joint gliding, we can move the foot in the frontal plane in motions that resemble abduction and adduction. In this case, the motions are called eversion and inversion, respectively. The next movement that we will discuss is rotation. This typically occurs along the vertical axis within the transverse plane and involves pivot joints of the body. Some pretty straightforward examples include medial and lateral rotation at the shoulder and hip, or even rotation between the first two cervical vertebrae that is seen when shaking the head back and forth. Another more complex example is seen at the proximal radio ulnar joint. This movement itself is straightforward, with the radius pivoting within the annular ligament, but it serves as a component of the more complex movement of alternating the position of the hand between the palm facing anterior or posterior. In pronation, pivoting at the proximal radio ulnar joint allows the radius to shift into an overlapping position with the ulna and directs the palm into the posterior facing prone position. In supination, a reversal of these movements unwinds the radius and returns the palm to anatomical position with the palm facing anterior or supine. This is probably a good time to introduce another complex motion known as circumduction. Circumduction can occur at any biaxial or multiaxial joint that permits flexion, extension, and abduction, adduction. It's actually a complex combination of these motions that allows the limb segment to move in a conical pattern. The joint serves as an apex for this motion, and the distal limb segment traces out more or less a circular pattern as it moves through space. It's pretty easy to confuse circumduction with rotation because they look the same on the surface. To highlight the difference, let's go back to our saddle joint demonstration. That combination of up and down and front and back motion allows our hands to move in a circular pattern. But once again, notice that our hands are not able to rotate. The first metacarpal phalangeal joint is an example of a saddle joint. Notice that I can make the circular motion, but I can't actually rotate the base of the thumb to make the nail bed face inward. 
Same thing with the other interphalangeal joints, which in this case are condyloid joints. I can twirl them around to produce circumduction, but I can't rotate the joint so that the nail bed faces the palmar surface. Let's look at circumduction at a ball and socket joint. I can circumduct at the shoulder, but notice that while I'm doing this, the palm of my hand is always facing down. Now I can rotate at the shoulder to make the palm of my hand face up because this is a multi-axial joint. But notice that this is a completely different movement when compared to circumduction. Some final pairs of terms to be aware of. First is elevation and depression. As you might expect, these terms refer to the superior and inferior shift of a bone segment and is primarily used in relation to the scapula and mandible. Another pair of terms often associated with these body segments are protraction and retraction, involving the anterior and posterior shift of a bone segment. It's pretty easy to visualize for the mandible. With the scapula, it's more of an anterolateral and posteromedial shift along the circumference of the thorax. There, you see? These directionality terms really do come in handy. That wraps up this second review session. Hopefully it was a straightforward reflection of the material you're already pretty comfortable with. Next up, we begin our journey into anatomy with the study of the back, starting specifically with the vertebrae. So until next time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.